So you guys want to look at some quickly Big look time. at some slides here of um, of uh, some of the great flood features. Yes. I usually start yeah. with the, the stuff out in the Pacific Northwest because that's where it's most spectacularly displayed. Pure and once you begin to, 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 awesome. to come to understand and, and be able to visualize this stuff, then you can see it um, where it might be preserved more subtly. Um, because a lot of this is, is just spectacular in your face. Other cases, it, it's more subtle. And you have to kind of learn to read this. It's, it's a cipher, literally. It's a language that you learn to read. And um, Brandon, I had, a, I had a question. So I was recently uh, in the Portland, Oregon area, um, and I had some free time, so I explored the Columbia River. And uh, I was there with some family, and I was, I was discussing um, Multoma Falls. And, Mult and Multnomah, yeah, Multnomah yeah, Falls. Yeah, Multnomah Falls. And there's a big undercut. And correct me if I explain this correctly. Um, and I think I only explained it correctly due to you, if I explained it correctly. But I, I was asking my niece, who's 13 um, at the time, I was asking her, the, you know, the falls is just beautiful and it, it's, it's dramatic. But you look and there's a huge undercut behind it. I asked her, I was like, hey, what, how did that happen? And she's like, oh, I don't know, the, the waterfall cut it. And I go, so you're telling me the, the waterfall that's flowing overneath cut the huge, uh, is, I mean, is it a cataract? Is that a cataract? Not exactly. I'll show you a picture of a cataract okay. in a second. But I was explaining to her that there was a large enough flood that cut into the side of the hill where there was once a stream flowing, and now there's now it's the it appears like there's an undercut uh, with a small stream flowing over into the Columbia uh, River. We have to bear in mind that that whole Columbia Gorge was cut by these giant floods sweeping through there, in some cases between four and 800 feet deep. And so if you have a, a, a let's say a gradual river valley, typical sort of a mm -hmm. gent, more gentle profile, and then you suddenly have three or four or 500 million cubic feet per second rushing through there, here's what it does. It begins to rapidly down cut and it'll shear off the sides and what you're looking at there is the remnants of this passage of these massive flood currents that essentially sheared off the valley sides and left these 400 foot cliffs. So the streams that were once flowing into what would have been a more typical river valley with, with uh, essentially more gentle slope sides now are coming up and there's this huge chasm there and they're just plunging down 400 feet. When you see that undercutting, that's because as the, this water is extremely turbulent. So there's mm -hmm. eddies like this. And then as the water declines down, what will happen is that there may be a more sustained uh, flow after the initial peak discharge. And that sustained flow will continue to eat away at the sides. Now, in the case of the Columbia there at Multnomah Falls, you're looking at, um, that's pretty much all basalt in there. Mm -hmm. And so what it'll do is it'll shear off the basalt. And then as the floodwaters go down, it continues to eat into the, into the bedrock laterally. And so it'll create these overhanging precipices, these overhanging um, rock formations and the undercutting, which is, which is something you can see many examples of that are clear indication of, of outsized water flows, um, flows beyond what uh, the modern scale of flows so even though i didn't explain it as eloquently as you did i did explain it to her correctly solely yeah. because of you just to be clear so thank you for that <laughs> well, well done i'm touched Doug. <laughs> <laughs> i now feel vindicated good, good. <laughs> your life has meaning <laughs> my life has meaning. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll let my niece know <laughs> Okay, we're going to go quickly through a series of yes. slides here. I guess I, I need to hit uh, screen share first um, so you can see what I'm seeing. Uh, share. Here we go. We will look at some uh, digital maps first. Okay, so this is what's known as the Telford Scabland Tract. And you can see very clearly here that we're all of the um, – this darker area, this is where the Luss topsoil, which in some cases is 200 feet thick, has been stripped away to the basalt bedrock, exposed the bedrock, and around where the soil, this Luss topsoil, as it's called, actually happens to be very fertile stuff. And so with a little bit of watering, which, you know, since the, the building of Grand Coulee Dam, part of that was a, a vast irrigation system to 
irrigate the Columbia Basalt Plateau. And because the only thing that Lust lacked for being a, a, a very viable uh, agricultural area was, um, was moisture, because there's only 15 inches or so of rainfall here on the eastern side of the Cascade. So what happened now is you see all of the, the little squares, you can see all of this is agricultural in here. But then in, interspersed in there is the, the stripped away bare rock. And this is the scars, literal scars, mm. left behind as these tremendous floods swept over the land. Um, and you can see it's how deeply it's, some of these, these channels here are three, 400 feet deep. The estimate is that they were probably gouged out literally in a matter of a week or two. Um, but we'll go through some here. Uh, let's just see. Uh, I'm going to. Crop so cycles. An... <laughs> <laughs> Who said that? Was that you, Sean? No, it wasn't me. <laughs> it was Doug. No, no, no. no. <laughs> No, Doug, these are not crop circles. Yeah, Doug. <laughs> Taking the blame for that one. No, that, was, that was Ben. Okay. I'll eventually learn to recognize your, your voices. I think I've got you down now that I know who's, who's saying stuff. But we're looking here. I'm up. the smart one. Okay. That's what I tell people. You know, I, I, I partners with my younger brother in, in the – in the building business and whenever we're meeting new people i say how you can tell us apart is i'm the smart good looking one <laughs> he's the other exactly. one exactly that's like but, you know, that's like what I, I tell my dad that uh, good luck skips a generation <laughs> yeah good luck yeah. yeah randall gets it so yeah <laughs> i get it yes yeah. yeah he gets us yeah okay well you know i'm sure it's like with you listen you don't survive the kind of in the construction business you do not survive without a sense of humor you would quickly, <laughs> no, it's pivotal. quickly go under um yeah. yeah yeah so i've done roof work where it's 10 degrees out and i've done roof work when it's 105 degrees and everything in between and you know it's it's like okay well this is where you have to gird up your loins and 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 tough it out <laughs> um, and make fun of yourself along the way otherwise someone make else fun will. of yourself the yes, whole time yeah. <laughs> right. a as you're feeling sorry for yourself well duh but you can't tell anybody that <laughs> no, no. okay so here we're looking at grand coulee if you've ever heard of grand coulee dam it's the largest concrete massive structure in north america um We've got Upper Grand Coulee and Lower Grand Coulee here. And Grand Coulee is an extraordinary feature. It came, there was a massive meltwater flow that came from the north, came down, if you follow my cursor, it's cutting down here, the Upper Coulee and then Lower Coulee. And then down here in this basin, you basically, the water spread out and created a fan. Um, uh, built out of all of the material that was stripped out of the creation of Grand Coulee. And one of the areas that's really interesting in Grand Coulee is the transition between upper and lower Grand Coulee, where you now have this Dry Falls cataract, which is a, which I'll show you a few slides subsequent here to this one. But, and then over here to the left, we have another magnificent coulee called Moses Coulee. And can you see this kind of arcuate or semicircular feature here? You see this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That represents the southern terminus of a glacial lobe called the Okanagan lobe. And basically what's happening there is this, is the lobe of ice moves. It's, it's in very oversimplified terms, it's essentially bulldozing up masses of this debris, this glacial till that forms what's called terminal moraine, which piles up at the snout of the glacial lobe. Then when the glacier lobe recedes back, it leaves this calling card in the form of this arcuate uh, moraine here. And so what you can see right here is this represents the southern terminus of this lobe. And you can see that Moses Coulee is emanating right off of that lobe. It was a direct meltwater event coming off of this lobe of the ice sheet. And this particular uh, Coulee uh, varies between 800 and 1,000 feet deep. It's a mile to two wow. miles wide. It was literally cut, I think, simultaneous. I think these two coulees were cut at the same time um, by these huge meltwater flows. And if to give you an idea, a melt, the meltwater flow that created either one of these things was roughly 20 times the volume of every single creek, stream, and river on earth flowing all together. Wow. All rivers flowing together. Wow. Literally Each cannot fathom that. 
No. Each one of these literally like 10 times the volume of every every bit of flowing water on earth. And so together, you're looking at a flow that would have been 20 times greater than every river on earth flowing together. So like my wife's period. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to comment on that. Badoomch? Badoomch. <laughs> Interestingly, when you get into the, into the mythology and the, the symbology, there's some interesting, you know, the, the breaking of the waters um, symbology has a lot of interesting things. We can do a future uh, conversation, and we should. We should, we should do a follow-up to this, you know, maybe later over the holidays or early next year or something, if you guys are into it. Yeah, yeah totally. totally. Good, good. Okay, so, so we're going to go through some more slides here so you can now – start seeing what some of this stuff looks like from a little closer up. So here's, here's a, uh, a digital map of the, of upper and lower Grand Coulee. Now there's a lake presently in upper Grand Coulee and right up here at the very top of the screen is Grand Coulee Dam, which was built back in the 1930s and created uh, what is called Franklin Roosevelt Lake here. And so what they did was once they created that reservoir of water, they pumped it up out of the, the Columbia, uh, basin here up into Grand Coulee. They built a dam at the southern end of upper Grand Coulee and they use this and there are aqueducts that, that emanate outwards from upper Grand Coulee taking the irrigation water out to, to irrigate the, the extensive lust fields that, that surround this like I was explaining to you. But right here at this transition between upper and lower Grand Coulee is a complex called Dry Falls Cataract Complex. And we're going to take a closer look at that. But what you can see here, what I have identified is called Cooley monocline. I don't, can you see me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, too. cool. Okay, so a monocline is if you have compression on the crust and it'll buckle, right? Right. Right, because you're, it can buckle up and become an anticline. It can buckle down and become a syncline. Or it can buckle so you go from one level up to another level, and that's a monocline. So right. an anticline, there's up and then there's back down. A syncline is down and back up, and a monocline is just up or down. And you can see this monocline right here. What happened was, is this water comes gushing off the ice sheet, it flowed down here, and then poured over the monocline. And what you had there was a waterfall that was about two miles wide and 900 feet high. <laughs> and it began to eat its way back up into the bedrock and ate its way all the way back up here to the edge of the ice sheet, creating upper Grand Coulee. Uh, once the water hit the, the monocline, it began to see when you create that monocline, what's happening is that uplift is fracturing the bedrock and creating zones of weakness, right? So the water flowing through there is going to exploit those zones of weakness and begin to strip them out. And that's what happened with lower Grand Coulee down here. And, I'm hoping that in the future, we're going to do a field trip and we will go up, we'll make a traverse up this coulee. And not there, it's one of the most impressive features, I think, on earth, especially when you know what its genesis is and you realize that you're, what a truly phenomenal feature you're looking at here. We're going to zoom in on this area that marks the transition between upper and lower Grand Coulee. We'll just hurry through some of this. You can basically see it just down here. You can begin to see the cataract complex in the lower area. Um, yeah. And you begin to see, let's see, Grand Coulee Dam is right up here. And interestingly, Grand Coulee Dam pretty much marks the position where that ice sheet ended right there. Um, but we will go. There's one feature I want to point out to you right here. It's called Steamboat Rock, which, it, which is a mesa that was left – and what you got to understand is that prior to this flood, this was a continuous layer of basalt across here. Right here, it's five miles wide and about 900 feet deep. Um, if, the, if the flood had continued on beyond even maybe a few more days from before the, the tap got turned off, this feature right here would have been washed away. It wouldn't exist anymore. Let's keep going here. Here's a, an aerial photograph. This is Steamboat Rock in the distance and we're looking wow. we're looking south down grand coulee oh, so now yeah. prior to the flood bear in mind that this was a thousand feet of basalt that was continuous across here yeah Jeez. stripped away leaving this island that would have been in the midst of this unbelievably raging flood 
Um, let's keep going. Wow. So, so yeah, so here's a, uh, here's a topographic map showing Steamboat Rock and a lot of the features around here. Like, see this? This is a cataract right here and without, that doesn't have a name. But you'll see how those cataracts form. That's, check this out. Okay, so you've got Castle Rock right here and next to it, you've got this cataract. So this is an aerial photo photograph I took, I think back in 1998. Here you see the cataract and here you see Castle Rock. It looks like an eddy. Yeah, and so picture the water is pouring over yep. this and as it's pouring over, what it's doing is it's plucking the bedrock and essentially eroding it or eating its way upstream. Sure. The yeah. longer the water the flows, eddy. the more that cataract is gonna recess upstream. Right. Here's an old aerial view of Steamboat Rock. Um, wow. Here's one that I took from the ground. And let's see, well, here is some of the kinds of sedimentary evidence you find within the coulee itself. So as the floodwaters are declining, bear in mind that these floodwaters are choked with, with sediment and debris. So they're sweeping along. And when the water finally begins to slow down, it, what it does is it begins to deposit all this material that it's carrying. And if you look carefully here, you can actually see this is almost like a preservation, a cross section, where you can actually almost see the currents preserved in the gravel deposits. And then within that, you'll see these isolated, this is a granitic boulder here, and this is a basalt, this dark one down here is a basalt boulder. Because right here is where two different types of bedrock come together. Right. On the east side, you have basalt. On the west side, you've got granite. So, quick question. Is, is there a debate on the mechanism in which created that uh, landscape? No, no. I, I, everybody now agrees that this is created by a catastrophic flood. The, the controversy becomes is what was the origin and cause of this catastrophic okay. flood? That's where the controversy now lies. You're not going to have, I don't think you're, you'd be hard pressed to find anybody who disagreed with the fact that this was catastrophically produced. Yeah, Michael Shermer might, but. <laughs> <laughs> you know, listen, I think he knows better now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and for the sake of Shermer, it's a good thing that, it, that, that, that that debate didn't go another 30 minutes because really the debate came to an end just at the point where I was ready to unleash. Yeah. The, yeah. The, the dogs of war on poor Michael Shermer, but <laughs> I was, uh, I started feeling sorry for him towards the end. And I did too. I, I did watched too. That. Yes. Yeah. I, I felt a little bad. Painful. Yeah. yeah. It got a little painful. Poor guy. It got a little painful, but yeah. you know, we all were congenial at the end and you know, Hey, he, he does what he does. And you know, there's an important role for the, for the skeptic. And in, in the case of Michael Shermer, Again, when you propose these kind of preposterous ideas, they deserve to be criticized. Well, what happens, though, is the criticism sometimes will be its own undoing because, you know, once you go back and forth and have this exchange of ideas, um, you know, a lot of times the criticisms don't hold up anymore. And that's basically like what's happening with the impact hypothesis. The, 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 the guys who attacked it are basically – having to retreat now because the evidence is overwhelming. Earth did get impacted by something that happened. 